Colossians chapter 3. Let's, uh, let's read verses 20, 22. I'm going to read all the way through 4, 1. Colossians 3, 22 through chapter 4, verse 1. Slaves in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, it is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do praise your glorious name. We're really thankful for your word, thankful that it deals with everything. You give us the big picture, and then you give us some practical uh, details and some tools or to be able to execute the plan that you've given to us in our daily lives, minute by minute, day by day. So we're appreciative, Father, for the teaching that you give us in, in the scriptures. And I ask, Lord, that you be with me today as I preach your word, that I would preach it truthfully, clearly. And Lord, also for everybody, all of us who are listening, including me, that we would take this to heart and be challenged, Father, by your word and ask ourselves honestly, how am I doing? Am I giving you my best? May you be glorified, Lord, through this message in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I was, I was actually thinking about two different messages, and I kind of I decided to pull this together into one. Um, you know, verses 22 and 23 is what I really, really want to work on, and chapter 4, verse 1. So 22 and and 4, 1, really go together about slaves and masters. So verse 22, slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth. Not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart fearing the Lord. And then jump to 4, 1, masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. I want to hit these together today. And the gist of it is, slaves, be obedient to your masters. And not just externally but actually legitimately from the inside out. Sincerity of heart, pleasing the Lord. Masters, be just and fair. Not just because there's some sort of uh, rules out there that are governing your business, but because you're doing this for the Lord. You have a master who is in heaven. And then what I really want to preach on this morning is each of us doing our work heartily as for the Lord. I want to quickly go through this first part. Uh, the particulars, the particulars of this, and then, you know, I, I find Colossians interesting because it gives us big picture, and then it drives down to the particulars, but even in the particulars, it steps back and says, hey, remember the big picture, remember the why. So we're in these particulars, husbands, wives, now slaves and masters, but I, I don't want us to miss the why in this, okay? So we're talking about slaves, I read the scripture about slaves, and to be honest, I have a hard time fully comprehending that. That's not the nature of the economy in which I live. I, I've never had an earthly master. I've never been in a situation where I can't go get a different job if I want one. I've never been bound to where I'm stuck here for life with no options. We actually live in a very blessed, blessed place and a blessed time in history. It's a rare thing, actually. You know, throughout history, slavery has been a normal part of the culture. You know, in the first century, conservative estimates that 10 to 20% of the entire Roman Empire were slaves. So anywhere throughout the Roman Empire, which was most of the world, you're going through and at least one out of every ten people, possibly as high as one out of every five people that you would see would anywhere is a slave. A third of the population in Italy was half, up, up to half of the people that you would see in Rome were slaves. So this was a normal occurrence. 
Matter of fact, many Christians in the first century, slaves. The meeting times and places, they, the reason they did it was to find a way that the slaves could make it to the assembly. Now, side note, not preach on this at all today, but a really cool thing. In the Lord's church, you could be a slave and be an elder in the Lord's church. Didn't have to be the successful businessman or the master to be so. Because in the Lord's church, there is no partiality, is there? Okay. There is no Jew, Greek. There is no slave nor free man. There is no male or female. Okay. So in spiritual sense, that has nothing to do with your spiritual standing. Matter of fact, I like what James would say in chapter 1. You know, basically, you, you rich, you glory in, humili in your humiliation because you're passing away. Oh, and, and you who are of humble circumstances, you glory in your high position because the Lord's raised you up. So God is very clear. That way, God doesn't go along with human social, the human social standings or system. But there's a reality in terms of while we're here in this life, here's the practicality. This is the situation we find ourselves in. What do we do in this situation? Now, even though there's no such thing as slavery... In, in our culture right now, in terms of, you know, similar to this, we still, each of us, find ourselves sometimes in circumstances, situations that we have no control or power to change. And so the attitude is still the same. What God asks of the, of the Christian slaves in the first century, he asks the same attitude and behavior from us. Slaves. Work hard. We read that verse twice. Slaves in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. What motivation would there be for a slave to work hard? A question for you. Have you guys noticed, particularly since coronavirus, but have you, have you noticed you go to a place for some sort of service and you walk away saying, Who's working here? Like, is anybody doing any work in this place? The service is, honestly, it's terrible in many places. And, and I feel bad. You see a few people that are working, and I actually try to comment to them and say, they don't get paid double for the people. They're getting paid the same amount as the people that aren't working. So, it, I mean, we're... We're starting to see a little bit. Why do you think that motivation in our society, why are we seeing that? Because we're getting more socialistic, right? And particularly with coronavirus, you could make more money by staying at home than by going and working. And it's continuous. I just, I'm not preaching in this per se today, but is, if we keep having the same solutions to the problems, and that's the government, give more money. It, it shocked me. I would never have time to watch TV Presidential debates, all that stuff. I just moved here to Bozeman, didn't have studies yet. I watched the presidential debate, and it shocked me. Biden's solution for everything was money. And I'm like, why doesn't anybody ask the question, where's that money come from? That money comes from you. It, you're, it's being stolen from you. I'm not preaching on this day, but a quick side note. <laughs> the free enterprise system. Adam Smith and his wealth of nations. The point that he makes is in a free market system, the amazing thing about the free market system is that when you treat other people right, you benefit, both as an employer and as an employee. It's a really cool, and actually all business transactions, when, when you play it out, the best way to be successful for yourself is treat other people right. That's a great free market system. It's beautiful. Absolutely amazing. That's why we've had so many blessings in this country, financial and otherwise, because of that system. It has not been the norm throughout history, and unfortunately, it's not the, it's, well, you know, it being taken away from us. So, we're starting to see some of that more clearly than ever. But we're still not slaves. What, what motivation would a slave have? To work hard. It's not going to change anything, anything for you on this life, in this life. 
Why would you work hard when these guys aren't? Why wouldn't you sneak away for the break when you could? Why wouldn't you just do, you know, external service, pleasing men, making sure you don't get caught when the, when the master's around, you do what you're supposed to do, otherwise all the same things that your co-workers do. But zero motivation except to please the Lord. And God appeals to that. There's no earthly reward, no hope of freedom in that. The reward or consequences are from the Lord. And so God makes that appeal. And then he says, masters, treat your slaves fairly. Grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. What motivation was there for a master to do that? None. No reason to. You aren't going to benefit from it as a master by treating your slaves fairly. On, in this life, no earthly reward. God is reminding us throughout this whole section. He sees everything, and he's the one we're going to answer to. That's in our marriages. That's in our work environment. So the reward or consequences are from the Lord. I'm going to shift this a little bit. And talk about employees, employers, because this is, this is the part I understand. It's, it's a step down from masters and slaves, for sure. It's a few steps down. But the principles, let's just talk about this quickly. Employees work hard. I already mentioned it. It's a rare thing now to find people that will work hard. Christians, some of us came out of an environment where we before we were in Christ, we didn't know how to work. One of the things God wants us to do is to learn how to work hard. It's important to him for our character, our inner man being transformed to the character of Christ. And I, I will say this. I've tried to teach my kids this. And I, I, some of you guys, please listen up. I can tell a few of you aren't already. You don't want to hear about this. You have all sorts of excuses built in as to why you don't need to work hard. I'm only getting paid so much an hour. So why would I, why would I do more than that? Something I've tried to teach my kids is regardless of what you are getting paid, you work what you are worth. And that is a true statement. Every single person... Who you are comes out and what you do, regardless of what you're getting paid. If you're only worth 10 bucks an hour, I don't care if they're paying you 30 bucks an hour. You're only worth 10. That's all you can work. And at some point, you're going to be back down to 10. You're going to get fired from your job. Maybe not right now in this environment because they can't find anybody to show up for 30 bucks an hour. But the principle is there. Sooner or later, if you are worth 100 bucks an hour, you're going to show up and you're going to work 100 bucks an hour even if they're only paying you 10. And it won't be long, one way or another, you'll be getting paid what you're worth. Uh, it may be, maybe I shouldn't say it won't be long, but somewhere. You are what you're worth. Same would be true if you're worth $1,000 an hour. You bring that. Who you are shows up. Laziness is actually stealing from your employer. Doesn't scripture teach us, let him who steals, steal no longer, but rather let him labor? Okay. Proverbs 18, verse 9, tells us, he was slack in his work, is brother to him who destroys. If you don't work hard, well, you might as well be somebody that's, that's well, you are tearing the place down. He was slack in his work, brother, to him who destroys. Laziness, stealing from God. Go with me to Jeremiah chapter 48. I want to read this one. Context is a little different. God has a judgment that he has actually rendered here on Moab. And he has those who are supposed to go and execute that. But there's a principle across the board. He says, cursed be the one who does the Lord's work negligently. And cursed be the one who who restrains his sword from blood. Work hard. Anybody, there's some, I'm going to veer off for just a second too. Anybody who was interested in paid ministry, work hard. 
you, you know, the, the challenge of paid ministry is basically you got to be your own boss. And I will say this, there's a principle from scripture that I am very committed to us doing here. And that is you do the work and you prove yourself and then you're going to get paid for what you do. Okay? If you prove yourself first. So, you know, some of you, we have some amazing young people in this congregation. Some of you guys coming up, some of you might think, hey, I, I want to do this. I want to. You work what you're worth, regardless of ever you're getting paid for it. You do the Lord's work. You don't do it negligently. There's a principle, this is the way God has this put into place. Laziness, ultimately stealing from God. But we know we're working for the Lord. Christians should be the hardest workers. You know, there's a... Well, I'm going to bring this in right now. 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to come back to that. I haven't even come close to getting to the part I want to preach on today. I've got to hurry up. 1 Timothy 6, 1 and 2. Let all who are under the yoke of slaves regard their own masters as worthy of all honor. So that the name of God and our doctrine may not be spoken against. Let those who have believers as their masters not be disrespectful of them because they are brethren, but let them serve them all the more because those who partake of the benefit are believers and beloved. Teach and preach these principles. Christians should be the hardest workers. I'm not going to say that you're always the most skilled. Okay? Sometimes people are more skilled than us in certain things, but you're going to show up attitude, effort, every single day, and it's going to speak out. You know Christian is somebody you can count on every day to bring the best. Daniel and his friends found ten times better than everybody else. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to warn us in this congregation. Some of us are blessed to work for other Christians. And sometimes that's an that's a environment that you can let a little bit of laziness naturally step in because... They're, they're, they're my brother. They'll watch out for me. They'll care about me. They'll... What's the scripture say here? Opposite of that. You actually work harder for them because they are going to benefit from it. Now, I'm going to challenge us. If we were to ask and get honest input, anonymous input from our bosses... Who is the hardest worker at my job? What I do? Would our name show up? If not, we got to do better. God expects that from us. This is who we are as new creations. Laziness in the workforce translates into laziness working for God. We are fighting uh, against, we're swimming upstream in a culture that more and more leaves us as acceptable, brethren. There's no place for that in, in me or in you. I want to work hard. First Peter 2, no, I'm going to skip that one. Just have a good attitude even to those who are unreasonable. Oh, and you know what? I know, the mind games, I've played them myself. Oh, they don't deserve my best. My boss, this, these guys, these guys, this one. Who are you working for? The Lord. Does the Lord ever not deserve your best? I, I know. We, we have to, and it's okay to fight through those. But the mental excuses are there as to why you don't need to bring your best. And God comes back and says, you're doing it for me. Okay. Employers. Treat your employees right. I want to hit, we read Colossians 4.1. I want to hit Ephesians 6 also. Ephesians 6, verse 9. Masters, do the same thing to them. Give up threatening, knowing that both their master and yours is in, are in, is in heaven, and there's no partiality with him. You know, it's interesting. I was talking to, to Tom Jacobs before family camp, and I was actually asking about an illustration I was going to try to use in my message about what TJ, electric, stands for. And Tom is such a humble guy. When I was asking him, he almost, it almost wasn't going to work as the illustration. Because I was like, Who's, whose company is that? What does that mean? He's like, 
It's like, well, it's ours. It says we're a family. We're a because Tom has a mentality that people work for them, he treats them as special souls, special people. See? That's an attitude that comes across in what he does. So I had to say, I know, but what, is, what does TJ stand for? Right? I had to kind of pin him down. Tom, Tom Jacobs. Okay, who, who really gets to call the shots? Okay, I, you know, to use my illustration for family camp, I needed him to give me certain answers. But, <laughs> but, the, but the point here is, that's the way God wants us to treat those who work for us. Okay? As eternal souls, okay? equally valuable to us. And God's watching. Okay? There is no creature hidden from his sight. All things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. We'll talk about rewards and consequences next week. We give an account to God, every single one of us, for what we do. So the way, I'm going to put it in these terms. The way you treat others... In this case, those who will be working for you is the way God will treat you. Because we have a master who's in heaven. I don't have time for this either because I really want to get to this next part. Philemon chapter 1, though, it is a cool thing. Philemon has his runaway slave. Looks like that slave gets converted. Paul is now sending him back. Onesimus, he's asking him to come back. And he says, you're going to get him back as more than a slave, also a brother. There's a relationship now in, in the body of Christ. And you want to treat them well. And be careful, though. You can't treat Christians because they work for you not the same way you treat people that don't, that aren't Christians. That wouldn't be right. You got to be fair. But there is a special connection because they're your brothers and sisters. All right. Big picture. Do your work heartily it's for the Lord. Entrust yourself. To him who judges righteously. This is true across the board. First Peter, I just stole a passage from there. God will reward. Entrust yourself to him who judges righteously. Whatever you do. there's a t Now, I, I do want to be careful about this. This is the only preface I'm going to make for this whole message. So if you think, Luke, you, were, you didn't talk about this, you didn't talk about that. Here's the preface. Sometimes cer certain things that we do. From a big picture standpoint, don't require our 100% mental effort and otherwise. You have to make, you do have to prioritize, right? You can't go run around like a chicken with your, even with a chicken with your head screwed on, on everything. Okay? Because you can't do everything. So there's a priority of, okay, this, you know, if I'm cleaning my room, for example, I'll just give that as my example. I'm not going to put as much effort into cleaning my room as I will other things because, it's just not that important to me in my list of priorities of what needs to be done for the Lord. So, so you, can, you can make some priority decisions. That's where you need to put your effort is figuring out, okay, what does this require from me? Then stay true to that. Don't opt out in the moment because you got lazy. So whatever you do, do your work heartily for the Lord. That means from the heart. Right? Do it with sincerity. So this is across the board. If I'm preaching a message, shouldn't I bring my best for the Lord? Week in, week out, right? Doesn't matter if it's peaks, family camp, week in, week out. I want to do the best. What if I'm listening to the message? Ah, gotcha. <laughs> shouldn't I bring my best week in, week out? The Lord wants that, doesn't he, from us? Whatever we do, what, if I'm vacuuming the stairs here, this is, I'm going to do that. I'm going to sign up, do it, follow through, do it, do it well. If I'm monitoring in the school, I'm going to bring my best for the Lord. If I'm doing the, the bulletin boards, we got some amazing bulletin boarders around here. That ain't me. Okay? I'm appreciative of people that do the bulletin boards. Jillian, Ashley, I think Mrs. Hoffman helps out on that side. I don't know who else. You're not, you're not always going to get the recognition, but I'm appreciative. You guys do amazing. It's great. It's, it helps out. Oh, how about potluck? Wasn't potluck last Lord's Day great? It was a good one. You know what I noticed about fellowship? One of, the, one of the versions, better version of the New Testament, actually translates it contribution. When you bring something to share, you contribute, that's when there's fellowship. 
It's good. It's the best. Hey, it's amazing. So if you don't, if you forget to bring something, still stick around. I'm not saying that, but there's an attitude. You guys, it was awesome. Hey, bring, bring your best for the Lord, hundred percent. I was thinking about this because some of the things I have to, in my mind, go through. I don't think I'm really the poor little old me sort of guy. I don't, I'm not really a, a pity party sort of person. Whether that's by nature or by habits at this point in time. But, but I do have some things sometimes that go through my mind. Like, well, I did this so I deserve this. I got to catch myself. Because that's not the question. The question is, what's the Lord deserve? If, if I'm thinking about what the Lord deserves, I like this passage from Revelation 6. The souls of the altars, or the souls of those who, are, who have been beheaded underneath the altar, okay? They, they gave themselves as martyrs for the Lord. What's the Lord deserve from me? If he wants my blood to be spilled, doesn't he deserve that? He spilled his for mine. There's no way, you know, he paid the debt I could not pay. I'm not talking about trying to pay him back. I'm saying in appreciation and gratitude, this is what the Lord deserves from me. So personally, guys, I, I mean, he deserves our lives. He deserves our best in absolutely everything. So personally, I'm going to give some examples here as we go through this. Then I'm going to say, I'm going to talk about myself because I've just recently made again, like pushed to the front of my mind, I am committed to giving the Lord 100% my best. This opportunity for you, if you want to join me in that, to do that. So if I say I, I want you to think about you as the I, okay, in this. But the Lord deserves our best in everything. I think about Abel. Hey, what Abel offered to the Lord a sacrifice that was pleasing to the Lord. Cain's wasn't. Now, I don't know. I don't think the scripture is definitive as to why. I've heard people say because Abel offered a a sacrifice of animals, and Cain offered the fruit. I don't know what they knew at that point in time yet. I know the Septuagint talks about Cain's, and it says wasn't rightly divided. I don't know. It, what we do know is whether Cain's attitude was just bad or whether he should have known better and traded that fruits and vegetables in for an animal, I, I can't personally definitively say. But we know his attitude, one way or another, showed up in what he brought, and Abel's attitude showed up in what he brought, and his was pleasing to the Lord. So I think about that. I want to give God whatever I sacrifice to him, I want it to be pleasing to him. You know, Abel's blood ended up crying out before the Lord because because of that sacrifice, somebody else was jealous and killed him. Side note, you do great, people will hate you because you make them look bad. You bring 100% every, every day to your job, There'll be some people that, wow, you're ruining the curve for the rest of us. That will happen to you in your life. Okay? So we want to bring our best to the Lord. That sacrifice of Abel's blood was pleasing to the Lord. So in my life, and you ask yourself this, who am I? What kind of person am I as a new creation? Yeah, I said this, but I've made a personal commitment to the Lord to give him my absolute best. I can't make this commitment for anybody else here. You got to make that commitment for yourself. But the Lord deserves my best. David, when he was, after he had sinned and he was wanting to offer Ornan, the Jebusite. Ornan said, I'll give you this place. I'll give you everything. David said, nope. I'm not going to offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. You know, I, I think personal sacrifice is what we're talking about here. I'm just going to give a little caution. One of the things I struggle with personally, I don't really big picture care for nonprofits and stuff. Some, some of our brethren do them, you know, have, have figured out how to do them right. But you got to be really careful. 
because you can look and pretend and fool yourself about all this stuff you're sacrificing, and you're not doing anything. I'm not going to offer the Lord something that costs me nothing. When, when you give to the Lord, it's got to come from you. There is no secular sacred split. You got to block out the noise, silence all the excuses. Well, so and so, so and so, so and so, so. Who are you comparing yourself to? Who cares? I, I remember that, uh, you know, again, these are things I got to fight through. You probably got to fight through them too. You know, Jesus tells Peter, hey, you're going to die hard, buddy. He's like, well, what about this guy? What about John here? He going to get off the hook? She says, if I want him to remain till I come, what's that to you? What difference does it make? This is, I'm not talking about John, I'm talking about you. Okay? God's not talking about the guy next to you right now. He's talking about you. To me, he's talking about me. What does, what does he deserve from me? So put the excuses away and, and, and make a commitment. I want to give my best to the Lord. Malachi chapter 1, I want to read this. It's a little bit of the, from the, the negative side of things, which is important. The scripture gives us both of these. Because human beings have an amazing ability to be delusional. So, one of the, a, a book on my shelf that I really like is, I, I probably like the title even more than the book. The book's got some good stuff, but Leadership and Self-Deception. Eh, uh, human beings' ability to deceive themselves off the charts. Okay? So God, God hits this. In Malachi chapter 1, verse 8, he says, but when you present the, now this is Old Testament, okay? But you, you can make the application to yourself on a New Testament system, and we will. He says, but when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? Let's see, which of these lambs are you going to offer? Oh, this one can't see anyways. Some of us have dogs like that. This is the one I'll give away because he can't really get around anyways. When you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? In other words, try paying your taxes with that. Would he be pleased with you or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? But now will you not entreat God's favor that he may be gracious to us? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. For from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name, and a grain offering that's pure, for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you are profaning it, and that you say the table of the Lord is defiled, and as for its fruit, its food is to be despised. You also say, my, how tiresome it is. You disdainfully sniff at it, says the Lord of hosts. And you bring what was taken by robbery and what's lame or sick, so you bring the offering. Should I receive that from your hand, says the Lord? But cursed be the swindler who has a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is feared among the nations. Do you think God wants your best? How about when we come to partake the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week? An attitude of encouraging each other, building up, consider one another how to stimulate one another to look, consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, right? So we're thinking about this. We're, we're coming in to bring our best to the Lord. So application for myself, Romans 12, 1. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, which is your spiritual service. My body is a sacrifice that God wants for me. What if I give him less than my best? What am I doing? I'm bringing what's lame, what's sick. It's not pleasing to the Lord. I like this one. Jesus is, you know, preparing. Um, I think this is for his triumphal, triumphal entry. He got to ride the donkey into Jerusalem. And he tells a couple of disciples, hey, go. You go past this place. You can see the guy with the jug on his head. Go, grab it, take, take the donkey. And he says, oh, if anybody says to you, what are you doing? Say, the Lord has need of it. So they do that. Whoever's donkey that was, those guys had a good attitude. The Lord has need. Okay, it's yours. 
Do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Jack's stewardship. Where my stuff? Who whose stuff is it really? My money, my possessions, my family, my whose is it really? The Lord has need of it. Okay, Lord, it's yours. I mean, we want to go extreme. What about Abraham when he offer up Isaac his son on the altar? The Lord has need of it. Okay, Lord, that's an amazing thing. When you do that, the Lord. He gives back to you. That's the, that's the character of God. But we say the Lord has need of it. Give him our best. Uh, Steve Prefontaine, amazing runner, one of my favorite stories. Not a godly man. And this is, these are guys motivate me sometimes. Because people who are, who are not Christian, they're outside of Christ. But they can apply it in the physical realm. I'm like, if these guys can do this in the physical realm, why can't I in the spiritual? I should. Steve Prefontaine knew he was born. I mean, the guy was an amazing runner, and he could push himself through pain. The guy never lost one race on the Oregon home track. And he had some, I mean, we're talking distance races, basically puking his guts out, but he would not lose. And he said this, to give anything less than my best is to sacrifice the gift. Well, God's given us an amazing gift as Christians, hasn't he? To give anything less than that? Instead of giving our bodies a living, holy sacrifice, we're sacrificing the gift away to somebody else. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. How'd you like having to turn to Obadiah today? It's nice to get one of those minor prophets thrown in there. And a, and a one-pager. <laughs> That's fun to find, right? Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, verily do it with all your might. If there's no activity or planning or knowledge or wisdom and she will where you're going. What are you saving up for? i got to pace myself. For what? What's eternity going to be like? If you end up in the wrong place... Shouldn't have saved, you shouldn't have been pacing yourself. If you do end up in the right place, but you give an account to God, it's like, did you need to save up that energy for there? We're going to have plenty. So we, we want to live in the moment as Christians. There's Any of you guys familiar with Alex? I don't even know how to say his name. Honold? Free Solo? El Capitan? I, Steve Doty said this so well. On some of those international trips... You're, you're on an 11-hour flight, and Steve said it perfectly. He says, you're, you're so bored out of your mind. Like you just want to eat the seat in front of you, okay? <laughs> so I don't usually watch much TV. I don't watch any TV other than, than some sports. I don't, I'm really not even a huge documentary guy, but I'm looking through. I got 11 hours to do nothing except eat the seat in front of me or find something to do. Okay, documentary, free solo. This was good. Okay, I don't, I don't know what the language was or anything. The guy's not a Christian, so I should be careful saying that. I don't remember any of that. El Capitan. This guy is a rock climber. He goes through all the practice stuff. I don't have time for the story. Long and short, he does it. No ropes, nothing. Himself, totally, all by himself, free. What's, what's the right word for free climbing, free soloing? Okay, free solo. Um, but this is what he said. He said, each day, each day there's a chance you might die. Yeah, you free solo El Capitan, that's probably a good chance. Each day there's a chance you might die. But then he says this. This is an atheist. He says, every living being on earth is facing that same existential rift. That's true. Today, you or I could die. I don't know the story behind it. It's really sad to me. Whatever, somebody driving the wrong way on the interstate here recently... I think Glenna actually saw it and told Elena, you wouldn't believe what I just saw. Two people died, the person driving the wrong way, and they hit somebody else and killed them. Today. Today could be the day. So what are you going to do for today then? 
If you're living for eternity, brethren, if we're in the right place with God and we're living for eternity, then you and I, we are the only people that can truly live in the moment the way God wants us to. And give him 100% where we are. We know, make the most of your time because the days are evil, right? We want to be pleasing to the Lord. We want to know, want to know what the will of the Lord is. Make the most of our time. The days are evil. John Wooden, famous former UCL, UCLA, the talking stuff sometimes. Give him my best. Here we go. UCLA. Ah, basketball coach, he, I like the way he said this. He said, you have to give 100% every day. Whatever you don't give, you can't make up for it tomorrow. If you give only 75% today, you can't give 125% tomorrow to make up for it. I like that reminder. There are a lot of people that are living for tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it tomorrow. I won't pound the table and say there is no tomorrow, but there is no tomorrow. Okay. Today, today, give the Lord our absolute best. Revelation 2.10, be faithful until death, and I will give you the crown of life. Faithful starts today. The moment-by-moment -moment decisions today. Again, Alex Honnold, he said this. He said, this is your path, and you pursue it with excellence. You give something 100% focus because your life depends on it. Guys, our spiritual life depends on it. Proverbs 132, the complacency of fools will destroy them. I think about Revel the letters to the church's revelation. Laodicea, one of the absolute worst killers in the church is mediocrity. Absolutely will wipe you and your kids out and the next generation. Matter of fact, Andrew was talking to me about spirit. And I was thinking about, did somebody... Oh, who among men? I, I don't have time for this. Zechariah 14 talks about God is not happy with those in Jerusalem who are stagnant in spirit. He's going to punish them, right? Mediocrity is a killer, brother. We, God wants our best. It starts with me. You can point that finger at yourself. Okay? This, this is who we are. This is what God wants. Keep, keep the blinders on, right? Focus, 100% focus. You can read Proverbs 4, 25 to 27. It basically says keep your gaze fixed perfectly in front of you and follows up from there almost almost doesn't count well, I came to assembly took the Lord's Supper didn't hear a word though because I'd rather play on my phone almost doesn't count I I talked to that person about a Bible study, but, you know, and never got back to him. Almost doesn't count. I was going to spend time with my kids, but, you know, that one game was on. Almost doesn't count. I want my sacrifice to be pleasing to the Lord. How about you? He deserves my best. Whatever you do, do your work heartily. As for the Lord. Employees, work hard for the Lord. I want to get reports from some of the brethren and employee people that Christians are the best workers. I don't know if we'd get that. Employee, employers, treat your employees right. But Lord, I just get reports. Hey, these are the best people to work for. They treat everybody right. They're more than fair. Whatever you do, do your work heartily. Lord deserves your absolute best, brethren. Give 100%. Let's follow through 2022.